this. Okay, so this month we are doing food illustration, uh, getting ourselves towards making a recipe illustration towards the end of the month. So I will be doing two, three things. Um, some um, just basic illustration of uh, fruit and vegetables and then moving on to layouts so that when you make a recipe, you can think in terms of uh, pictures. Uh, the this is um, so if you might not be familiar with this, but this is um, an annual project that I encourage students to participate in. All you need to do is illustrate one of your own recipes. The condition is that you should be able to make what the recipe is about. So there's no point in pulling out a recipe from um, Tarla Dalal's book and writing it because if you can't make it, then it's pointless. I try to encourage everyone to make their recipes personal so you can write a story or you can write something about it that um, reminds you of a time from uh, when you had that food. Uh, that way it starts, <coughs> the book starts becoming more unique and readable. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of recipes that have been drawn out. So I will share some more information with you as we go along. If you have any questions, please feel free to pose anything on the group. The group is very helpful. They have all participated. Many of them have participated in this before. So they will be able to guide you as well. So I've shared some images on the group. These are clusters of vegetables, which I'm going to help you illustrate. So very often when we are doing illustration of recipes, we put all the ingredients together and we would uh, <clears throat> then go about writing the recipe. When we're normally writing a recipe, it's fairly simple. You write the text, you, you would write a, the name of the recipe, ingredients, method, any special processes, and that's about it. But when it comes to visualizing it in pictures, there's a ton of options that you can choose from. And uh, it's up to you how unique you want to make it. So through this, I want to show you different ways in which you can um, uh, illustrate uh, food. Sometimes it is uh, just the ingredients. Sometimes it's the prep work. Sometimes it's the finished product. So we'll get to what works best and what conditions to help you make the right decisions. So let me share the uh, images with you and I can speak about that a little bit also. <laughs> so I've put together some illustration, uh, some photographs from Pinterest where they have these nice uh, compositions of different types of vegetables. Here we have some gourd, some peppers, there's onion, garlic, some bulbs, and some herbs. Then uh, the third picture is different fruit uh, plus vegetables around the periphery. Here we have a very nice array of vegetables, very well color coordinated. And here again, there's some peppers and chilies. And here is an arrangement on the table of different uh, uh, ingredients. It's just all sort of assorted ingredients. So when we are illustrating a recipe, instead of just taking up... Uh, uh, maybe I'll just draw this out. I can explain better when I'm drawing. <clears throat> so for a beginner, when you start off with <clears throat> a recipe illustration, excuse me. Visualize on a page how you're going to write it. Mostly you would think of text, ingredients, and description, method, so on. So this is more or less a standard format. A few things might change according to the volume of your content. But how does one visualize this in, for, in the form of pictures? The most direct 
translation is pretty much in the order that you will write your recipe, you will make different types of foods. Because this is how our mind thinks. You have one, two, three, four, five, six. You create that order and then you would probably go ahead and write the text. Another way is you would write the ingredients or sorry, draw the ingredients. And then you might also draw pictures of the processes. So you might draw, wash the, your, your ingredients, put them in a pressure cooker, then saute them in a pan, add some oil perhaps, things like that. So you might use small symbols to also draw the method. And you'll notice that you're slowly moving, advancing from just a basic recipe to something more illustrative and a little more engaging. But what I want to try to do today is throw this out and make a page that looks more or less like a double spread. So what if we have a recipe pretty much like this? But you want to make an illustration on the on the full page. So how would you translate something like this into a full page illustration? For this, <laughs> it's good to have a composition of all these and make that look interesting. Now, the pictures that we have right now can give us an idea of several possibilities like the first picture we have these zucchinis and gourds this could be some kind of stew or grilled vegetables so instead of showing the grilled vegetables themselves these colorful vegetables will make a much better composition and it might be a little different for the person who is reading the book also to instead of seeing a bowl full or a plate full of grilled vegetables, which honestly speaking to illustrate are very boring because everything looks very dead when you illustrate. In a photograph, you can do all sorts of things. But in an illustration, we have to be very careful. So between the two, this might look a little more vibrant and more attractive. So these are the pages that we are exploring today. <clears throat> Now, the picture that we're going to make is going to be this rainbow colored vegetable composition. Oh, sorry. <coughs> this one. So the process is fairly simple. We are going to draw out these shapes and then put them all together in the composition the way we see it and then start coloring them now if you've not done this before it might come across as very daunting so we am, i'm going to pick and choose a few ingredients that we are going to draw and paint in isolation and then once you get a hang of it it doesn't matter whether it's a pepper or whether it's a plum you will be able to do exactly the same thing trace the shape and then draw it and paint it according to the light and shade, shadow, contrast, all of the same. <clears throat> Sorry, my something stuck in my throat. So let's try drawing something very simple. There is a red pepper on top. Okay, so I'm going to advise uh, Rohit and Shweta to keep the reference image in front of you. If you have another device, just keep it in front of you so you know what I'm pointing to while we're drawing it. Otherwise, you'd just be following me blindly and maybe some information may be lost there.
So I'm going to start off with drawing this pepper first, then this bengan, and this purple cabbage. <clears throat> These are the slightly tricky uh, looking vegetables. If there's any others that you think you might like help with, I can help you as well. So before you attempt to make a whole composition, it's always a good idea to identify or isolate one of those components, try to draw it, paint it, understand color, composition, shadow, uh, <clears throat> contrast, highlights, all of that in one. And then the rest becomes easier to observe. Literally, it's about being able to see all those things in a picture. So here in this case, the red pepper that we are making, you always start off with a familiar, easy shape. So I'm going to be making a circle, not too large, just about the size of a rupee coin. And uh, I'm going to be making it slightly darker so that it's visible to all of you, but you can make it much lighter. So this is our, more or less our circle. And if you look at that pepper, it's got a shape like slightly rounded from the sides. Just a silhouette. Over here, part of it is being obscured by the other pepper. So you can ignore that. And then you'll notice that there are some segments of the vegetable that come inward. So you draw all those that you can see. <clears throat> In drawing these edges, what you need to look out for are basic things like direction of line. <clears throat> uh, the length. <laughs> So, <clears throat> and this will give you the overall proportion. So all you need to watch out for is how wide is this part? How far do I take this line? And you take in this picture, you will see that this hole goes almost straight up. I often use the clock face to give myself direction. So you've got the line at 12, 6, 3, and 9, and then all the different o'clocks in between. So this line seems to be going a little towards a left of 12, 12 o'clock, if this is the center of the clock, turns a little to the left, and then becomes more horizontal. Then the next line comes from the side, goes straight up and turns again. Whenever you're drawing this, quickly check whether you've got the distance between the first line or the previous line and the next line uh, accurately or close to accurate. <clears throat> drawing has nothing but trying to identify um, the let's say the lines you see in nature, which will help you create the shape and uh, help you recreate the illusion of what you see in your reference image or again, back in nature. So literally line by line, if you follow just this direction, length curve of line, placement, Proportion. Size and shape. So these tips also help you verify whether or not you're drawing it correctly. Very often when you're drawing, you say, I'm, I see something, but I'm drawing something completely different. How can I check I am drawing exactly what I'm seeing? So you need to keep looking at the object that you're drawing for every line that you're making. 
even for something as ubiquitous as a pepper, you should be able to look up, draw a line, look up or look to the side to where your reference image is and draw the shape. <clears throat> Okay, Rohit and Shweta, have you begun drawing? Yes. yes. Okay, good. If there are any issues, please feel free to ask me. Show me your pictures and I can guide you further. Sure. Okay. Now, once you're comfortable with the shape that you've made, identify the place where you see a highlight. Since this is a first draft or a rough image, we can have many of our pencil lines visible. <clears throat> Similarly, now we can also make the Bengan. For something like Bengan, banana, uh, the gourds that you see, if you're not sure about this shape, um, don't make the shape in one shot like you would make a balloon or something. There are often cues in the parallel edges. So here the line is not parallel. It's a little closer to the first line but then it bends and becomes a little wider. But essentially, even if you draw two parallel lines in a curve, join one end with a curved shape like so, and at the other end, make um, this, whatever, what, what would this be called, like the, cap that's good enough <clears throat> and now because I have space over here I'm also going to make that purple cabbage I don't see the right side end so I'm just going to imagine it it's just a very amorphous shape coming down into the stalk and then that stalk itself for the creating this, uh, again, continuing the amorphous shape. And now in this case, I just need to draw the stalk. So first I will draw a triangular shape at the base, like a regular straight line triangle. And then from there, I will just draw a few white lines to indicate the stalk and the base of certain uh, leaves. Here it's important to imitate the shapes that we see in, in their as, as accurate as you can get. <clears throat> Again, over here on the Bengan, we have a uh, very prominent highlight. Okay, is everyone comfortable drawing these? Yes. <clears throat> Okay, shall we start painting? All right. 
So if you've Alti, got... I have a question. Yes, Rohit. So how do you start thinking about the details in the red cabbage? Is that when you are rendering the color or you're just blocking out these big um, chunks of design? When you have such a detailed design like the cabbage, uh, you drawing it is pretty senseless. If you feel you want to, uh, you can, of course, make just single line textures, which you will be painting over just the line itself and mm. in the process of painting the line you will leave some gaps between that will create the texture of the cabbage so i would have first given this a uh, light wash which is what we're going to do and then we can go ahead and make those lines usually it's a uh, it's a good idea to avoid making extra lines in a drawing right in the beginning if you can do away with lines, if you can just paint those lines, then it's always better any day because pencil lines add a gray undertone. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it can just get in the way. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, if you Thank have you. the flexible eraser, lighten some of your drawing lines. Often when we're drawing, if we've gone over and over a space like I have done over here, you can have a very dark undertone of the uh, of the graphite of the pencil, which you want to avoid. Any straight lines are also avoidable when you're drawing organic elements because straight lines are most unnatural. Now here, there's a weird overlap. I'm going to change this and make the cabbage overlap, very firmly overlap the bell pepper. Now, when coloring, I'm going to be using the names of the colors. If you have the same kit, you will have a small sheet which will have the names of the colors written. So this is for Rohit and uh, Shweta. Just keep that sheet handy so you can read the names of the colors that I'm uh, calling out. We'll be using a medium and a small size brush. So something like a six, seven, eight is medium. And then you have a small brush, which would be a number one or two, or even zero to make the details. These are the two brushes we'll use. <clears throat> Keep a rag handy. So often we will be using the rag to <clears throat> change or reduce the amount of medium or sometimes water that we have in our brush. It's not always used to wipe your brush, but also to control the medium. When coloring anything like fruit and vegetables, uh, let me maybe write this down. Think in terms of layers. With every layer, you will add more depth. So you will paint something less or paint something else. We will first lay down the base tones and then go to details. We move from light colors to dark and always keep or let's say protect. I can't erase. Keep the highlights protected. In watercolor painting, highlights are like uh, babies. They can't look after themselves. We have to look after them. And the details are like adults. There's a lot we can do with details. They are malleable. Hajar things can happen. So between the highlights and the details, <clears throat> we have the mid-tones, 
which again can be very playful. You can have a lot of fun with them. But once you wash over a highlight, you can't get it back. So uh, it's like, uh, literally like children, you hold their hands, protect them, make sure that nobody comes and uh, influences their edges. So when starting, when I say lighter colors, it does not always mean the lighter uh, color of the same shade. It can also be different shades, depends on what shade you finally want to arrive at. So in the case of the bell pepper, I will first give a wash of um, gamboge, that's this warm yellow color, and orange. So I will make a very small puddle over here of these two colors because we have a very small painting to make. And put this down as a base color. So this is gamboge plus orange. Now when applying paint with a brush also, um, try to press the brush down. Painting is very different from drawing or coloring with color pencils or crayons we tend to often use just the tip for painting. But a paintbrush is very dynamic. So you can do something like this. You can splay the edges and make your paint spread out very beautifully. So don't be afraid of your brush. That whole edge has to be used. In the event that some of the color comes out, it's okay. Watercolor will always dry and become lighter than when it was uh, is applied first. So this gives us a nice warm base coat to start work with. Do you want to give it a shot? I'll, I'll wait for you to finish it. But do it within about three minutes. Don't spend more than three minutes painting because if you are, then you're overworking the watercolor and that is going to make the color very dull. Now, often when we are painting something like that, we also do a wet on wet. So the second layer, I'm going to demonstrate a wet on wet technique. Now I'm going to add a scarlet to the same mixture. So a little bit of orange. We can forego the Cambodge. And I'm going to make a mixture aside of scarlet, a little bit of crimson. That's this one. And a little bit of burnt umber. So it's a very deep, red or even a dark brown, you might say. Now, when making a wet on wet, you should have all colors that are going to go with each other ready. I want you to just observe this first and then you can make it. So I'm applying the color from the center. And 
And I could also leave another highlight over here. My brush strokes are very precise and they're all moving towards the outside. They are following the curve of the fruit. And as I come towards the end, I will now insert, without washing the brush, I'm going to insert the darker shade in vertical strokes so that I get a deep shadow at the bottom. Okay, I'm going to show this one more time. Here there's nothing happening. So I will just mark the edges of the highlight. And then as I pull this down, It's a little lighter here. So I'm going to just press my brush down to make it lighter. And then now I've dipped into the deeper color and I'm going to use the same strokes coming down. Now here, always remember to see that the edge into which you are inserting the dark color has uh, still got some wetness to it. If it has dried, then forget it. Then you can make a new wash and then insert the color. Aditi, can you tell me the uh, color combination that you use for this one, the yes. red one? Yes. So this is orange and scarlet. And this is orange scarlet plus crimson plus burnt umber. Okay. What we're doing over here can be called color blending. So you make sure you have adequate medium in your brush. Not too much because that will create almost a pool of color. You don't want that. So just enough to stain the paper and stay wet while you insert the next color in. Adequate hydration. So that again means not too much water. Keep colors ready. And keep Loading the brush before it completely runs out of paint. Right now, if your colors from the first segment to the last segment look slightly different, don't fret about that too much.
Now for the ones on top, if you are comfortable painting them in the opposite direction, go ahead. But don't even think twice about turning your book around so that you get the right angle to move your brush. That's more important. Something like these bell peppers, I like, I prefer to paint segment by segment if I'm going to do much detail. Now, again, over here, there isn't much of a shadow. So, unless you can see the shadow, don't just draw it like formula. The shadows in um, burnt sienna are only towards the bottom, more prominently so. There are some shadows in the ridges in between. We'll come to that when we make the detail. So over time, you will start painting many of these things very instinctively. Like over here, there's just a little bit of burnt umber. So you don't need to follow formula. It's all about looking at the reference image and recreating the illusion. Now, before we go further, with the very small brush, like a zero number or one number brush, try this. Some of the edges need to be softened. So all you do is hydrate your brush, very little water in it, and just go along the edges. Don't put too much water there, because otherwise that will dislodge all the paint. So just go along the edges quickly and soften them. And you don't even have to go through all, just a few places. And do this before we paint the stock. If you are happy with your highlights, you don't even have to do this step. I'm perfectly fine not doing it. But you might see a certain highlight and you feel that its edges are too sharp. Then you can make them softer. Then using the same brush, we'll recreate the color of the stock. Can I move on? Is everyone with me or do you would you like me to wait? Okay, no protests, so I shall move on. <clears throat> Always here also give a base coat. The edges of, uh, sorry, the highlights on the stock are not as shiny. But here, uh, I'll tell you the color that I'm using. This is sap green, gamboge, and yellow ochre. Sap green plus gamboge plus yellow ochre. So part of it has a darker green. I think that dark green we can add some um, cobalt blue. And look at the quantity that I have made. It's just so much. This is the lighter color. This is the darker color. I'm using a very small brush to again color blend my way. Usually from light to dark, that works the best. But in some cases, you can also work dark to light. Just make sure that when you are blending, the edges that you are blending are hydrated.
Now, if there's, once you've laid down the color, if there's any more detailing that you would like to do, wait till the first layer has dried and then we will do more detailing. Now the stalk has dried and there's just a few textural lines there. I'm making them along the edge of the main stalk. Now here again, if you're comfortable with making these lines, it's good. Otherwise you can just make a few uh, marks along the edges as you see in the reference image. Avoid making anything imaginary. Don't assume anything. Always look at the reference image for cues. And then after everything is done, we will use our burnt umber you can add a little bit of cobalt blue in that to make it slightly deeper and reinforce some of these shadows just from the edges. Now, how, the way we have painted this has been very specific. I've tried to make it as step-by-step -step for you as possible. But believe me, many watercolor artists will not make it so specific. You would do mostly just washes and do a fadafat uh, job of painting. I'm just stepping away for a minute. Just give me a second, Okay, how's everyone doing? Are you happy with your bell peppers? No. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can like I have a it up. <laughs> no, no, let me have a look. It could be just a consistency issue. Yeah. Oh, very nice, Elaine. Are you happy with it? Okay, good. Uh, I tried to salvage mine. Okay. 
Uh, one second. Let me let me just pin your image so I can take a closer look. Okay, so you're on the right track. A few contrasts are uh, missing and the ones that are there are too stark. That's all. So if what I could do is um, the starts of the ridges where you've made them nice and dark. Along that edge, if you could just make a line coming down in just one or two places to join the bottom. Uh, actually, Rohit, could you share this picture on the group? Because I'm talking only in space. I'd like to show yeah. it to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can do that. Okay. Okay, Shweta, how, how are you doing? Aha, uh -huh, nice. Are you happy with it? Not really, but yeah, for the first time maybe. It's pretty good. You've got a good highlight. You've got shadows at the opposite side of the highlight. That's a great start. Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. Let me see. If... Have you sent it, Rohit? It's coming up. <clears throat> yeah, just okay. it. Right. So you've got the structure. Um, sorry. Now see these spots over here. All these can have a slightly deeper color on the red side of the dark line. And part of that can come down to towards the bottom. So that's it's it's partly there. You're fifty percent there. You've got the base color and you've got the shadow. But what you don't have are adequate mid-tones. Now, here something has gone wrong where the ridges are misaligned. There's one line that's come from the bottom, which should I ideally be attached to or uh, aligned to this line here. But nonetheless, we don't have to bother with it right now. It's just an observation problem. And then you've got a very nice... Sorry, not red. You've got a very nice uh, highlight and shadow over here, quite organically. Highlight, shadow combination. That's pretty good. So if, if this is your first bell pepper, I think this is good. We can move to the we can move to the Bengan from here. And then you'll you'll start becoming more comfortable with placement of your brush, consistency, how to uh, spread the color out and then you won't have too many white patches and things like that also. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, let's move on to the bangan. The bangan and the um, red cabbage have the same color. So it, it's going to become easier for us. This is a combination of um, ultramarine blue, that's the one in the center, and crimson. These two colors give us a fabulous array of purple, mauve, uh, violet, depending upon the combination in which we blend them. So whenever you're blending colors as well, 
avoid making one giant pool of a color. Start with one color, but if you're making adjustments, it's best to make adjustments in one corner so that you still have the first color and then you have a newer color. This color you will have to mix visually. The color is a little, um, it's like a deep purple color. And a lighter variation of that will be used for a little wash given to the bangle. Essentially, they're the same. This is ultramarine. Plus crimson. And this is more crimson. So since we have to wait till the wash dries, just take a little bit of that reddish color. And um, now here's the trick. You can avoid this completely. Just in a few places, lay this down as a base coat. That's about it. No more. Because you want a lot of white to be visible. This is the color that's more crimson. And for the bengal, we can give it a base coat of the slightly bluer color. Just spread out your brush bristles. Now we have to let this dry. As you can see, in some places, my color has become a little denser. In some other places, it is lighter. Don't fiddle with this and definitely don't try to equalize it. It will be equalized in the next layer. In terms of uh, hierarchy of Thicknesses, a wash is always pretty watery and a detail color is always very thin and then in between you can have any number of consistencies. Now the fun part about washes is if you are daring enough, you can create a lot of interesting effects like Some places like these where if you add the color when the color is wet, you create a nice blend. I'm getting an unnecessary highlight over here. So going by that rule of paint something else or paint something less, I'm going to leave that highlight to my advantage. And... Also, you'll notice that sometimes vegetables within themselves have multiple colors. So I'm adding uh, an additional ultramarine blue in some areas. Maybe even here. But if you're going to drop any color in a wet on wet situation, it has to be quick, brief, and over before you know it.
Now using a thin brush, we can make the details of the red cabbage. Now here is a trick that I like to use. Uh, well, it's not trick as much as when you see so many lines, it can get really confusing where to start and how to execute this. What I try to do is find one line that I can follow end to end. And in this case, you might find that line along one of these white edges. And you focus on this one line and draw it as far as you can see it. Again, turn the book around if you feel you can't reach. Okay, so I have drawn this one line throughout. And now all I need to do is follow the curve. So now I'll draw the line from the other side. Don't join it there. Just follow the first curve that I have made. Now this can be a tedious process, but believe me, it is so totally worth it. Obviously our lines are not going to be as close or as thin as a cabbage for sure. But details like these can really attract attention. End of the day, we want our illustrations to be eyeball grabbing. We can also have some in uh, unconnected lines in the middle like these just to add to the texture. They don't all have to go all the way. But make this shape very seriously. Take your time. Good art is not about uh, finishing first or finishing fast. Because once you've made your artwork and it's out there, it's just out there. And more often than not, you will not be there to defend yourself to say, look, I didn't have time. Oh, this is my first picture. Oh, I had no idea. Or I had something else to do. Every artwork needs to be taken um, or executed, assuming that this is going to be seen by um, either somebody you admire, someone you love, somebody whose opinion matters. And then in that case, what would you present to them that you would be proud of? So take your time. At this stage, if you feel not underconfident about these lines, just take a pencil and draw some of the prominent lines. And you know that the remaining you just have to fill up in that space. Now, somewhere over here, you have 
a slightly larger leaf also available. Here is where we can make shadows. And the stalk of the bangan also pretty much the same way. Over here, that stalk is looking really black. And uh, black in a painting does not look very attractive, especially when you have fruit and vegetables to paint. So I am deferring to my own sensibilities and making them the same color, the stalk the same color as that the color that we'd use for the bell pepper so it will maintain a nice lightness colorfulness to the composition if we make it black it will not look natural and it will attract far too much attention when we don't need it Now see how in the Bengan, I have not colored the whole thing green. I have left a few parts un, uh, or lighter and I've kept a few parts darker. So don't make an outline only along this edge. Color inside a little bit also. And unevenly so that looks, uh, so that looks more natural. So how comfortable are you painting the second lot of vegetables? A pair, not even a lot. Let's see, Shweta's. Nice, very good. Super, let it be. Very good. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, shall we move on to the drawing bit now? Drawing this entire cluster. We have just short of 20 minutes left so i want to tackle the drawing bit the painting i think all of you should be able to do it it's pretty much the same thing layers light to dark a little bit of detailing towards the end maintain highlights keep them protected and you should be able to paint everything that you see now the beetroot is looking that horrible gray color because it's probably 
either freshly uprooted or it has dried. I don't know, one of the two. But we can always paint the beetroot much deeper and no one's the wiser. But it makes your picture look very attractive. So when we are uh, illustrating a complex group like this, it's all about understanding distribution of space. Space is distributed by categorizing objects and then distributing the objects evenly so that they occupy an even amount of space leaving very negative, very little negative space to be negotiated. So let me demonstrate what I'm trying to say here. Now we've got some medium-sized fruit and we've got some small fruit. I don't think there's very large uh, fruit available uh, seen over here anyway. So here are the medium sized in blue. Three, four, five, six, and maybe the banger, seven. Now, if you look at them, they almost look like with these seven colors, they have managed the wind cure. We don't have an indigo colored edible, but they've got two purples to make up for that. And they, we don't even have blue. So starting with the three bell peppers, which are predominant and their colors are very distinctive. We come down to the lettuce and the artichoke and then the red caps, uh, red cabbage down to the bengan. These, this placement is interesting. And then interspersed in between, we have objects that are smaller. So you have, oh, you don't see this, sorry, let me use white. So you have this half cut orange, lemon, avocado, apple, and spring onion. We could also count the beetroot in that. That's maybe about it. So as you can see, the purple from the bottom has also come on the top. Almost to indicate as if beyond the red, there is more purple. Then you have orange, yellow, pretty much next to other orange, yellow elements. You have this lovely green apple as a transition color between the green bell pepper and the artichoke. Likewise, the avocado. And same here with the uh, spring onion. And then we have an assortment of smaller elements, which are more numerous, which is often the case. You have a clump of radishes here. You have a clump of carrots. You have a clump of peas. You have a clump of blueberries. Uh, Pretty a large sprig of coriander and these root greens. So the smallest elements are always numerous and they occupy a large space because they want to fill up the space. And everything else is slightly smaller and smaller. I'm going to share this image so that you get uh, at least you'll, once you see the image, you'll remember it. So when we are bringing this down, blocking it on a paper, you can look for cues uh, that are pretty much the same. Our natural instinct, again, is to go from top to bottom. So you'll start off with maybe the 
beetroot here and then you'll draw the bell pepper and then draw little little elements as you go along that is perfectly fine that can work as well but a quicker method is to maybe draw the bigger sections first so i would i would draw the area covered by the red bell pepper orange bell pepper but I'm also going to give it some shape. This is slightly rectangular shape. Then I have, I think this is a zucchini. Then another pepper. So can you see how I'm building steps as I go along? Then I have this apple, avocado, artichoke, red bell pepper, green salad, green onion and bend them. Then when we come over here, we have lemon. We have this peas, blueberries to use up some space. Lemon, only orange over here. Carrots. These are not coriander, these are carrot greens. Sorry, I just misunderstood. Then you have radishes, one, two, three. And you have beetroot. Once you have this in place, it becomes a lot easier to draw details. And you can draw details even in ink if you feel like it. When you're drawing all these clumps, all the, uh, all the composition, don't pay too much heat to the opacity of objects draw lines through and through and after this we can start making the details so i'm going to start off with this avocado here i have a size but i don't have a shape so I'm going to give myself a good, goodly sized avocado. Here's the pit. And these lines again, remember when we are painting, are temporary. So don't make too many details. Try to indicate what you are trying to show with as few lines as needed. Only to make uh, like a fence around uh, around the area in which you are going to paint Here I have a bell pepper coming. Your final image can be different from your rough sketch. A lot of adjustments take place. A lot of your objects change in proportion. So be open to adjusting sizes of the finished fruit according to how the space fills up. If you remain stuck about proportions and are adamant that 
what you've drawn as your rough proportions are the right proportions you uh, and sometimes they may be but most often they're not you may have things like a bell pepper that looks bigger than the radish as is given in the rough image as is given in the reference image and you don't want that Once you have finalized your line, then you can do away with some of the rough lines so that your picture looks cleaner and cleaner. If you've drawn very lightly and you don't need to, sometimes it's okay to not erase also. Now here my apple has become slightly smaller so that it's not overlapping the zucchini. I have to just take note of that and move forward. And at this point I have another bell pepper that's overlapping this edge. All these little, little cues are helpful. When you come to the textured uh, artichoke, it can be a little overwhelming because you only land up seeing the detail of the texture. So if you have done a little bit of, say, doodle textures or um, just some kind of design or pattern work, this should be fairly easy. Start from what looks like the bottom or base. And you'll notice that in case of fruits and vegetables like these, like even pineapples for that matter, if you get the base, which is somewhere over here, slightly bigger, everything else is just nestled in this. So the next shape is somewhere here. The one next to that is somewhere here and so on and so forth. Even Sita for custard apple will look like that. And little by little, your texture will just get built up. Now I have to bring my bang them up slightly.
Okay, how's everyone doing? Are there any difficulties that I can help you out with? Oh, let's see, Janita, I'll just pin your illustration. Nice. Is Are you comfortable making this? Some places I can't see, it's very light, which is also a good thing. Okay, yeah, oh, wait, what has happened over there? Huh, yeah, you know, your salad has crept into the yellow bell pepper a lot more than it is necessary, I think. Uh, I wait, I can't see, I, I can't hear you. I, I can't hear you. Sorry, I was on mute. The orange one, the angle from the top view, how yes, do yes. you sketch that? It's, uh, yeah, see, I've already drawn that here. So it's it's a little squarish. Can you see it? It's a little squarish on the top. Oh, let me spotlight on. So how do you start off? That is. So I I have made this shape, and then I start off with the silhouette, like we did this fellow also. So this top side I can see is it's like part of the circle. This part is also like part of the circle. From here, the circle continues like this. This part is circular. And the rest is an extension on the right. That's how I saw it. So do you think all of you um, would like to... Ah, wait one minute. Jenita, let me see this. I haven't seen yours. Ah, nice. I think it's looking good. Yeah, Elaine, let me see yours. Okay, very nice. I think it's looking great. Thanks. In the beginning when I started drawing now, I didn't realize you were drawing on this side of the page. I always draw on the other side. So I had yeah, done yeah. this, but it's very small. I think I should have done the whole thing bigger. Yeah. When I started painting, I realized there was something else you were painting. So then I started that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were doing that. Then look up. So oh, it's very okay. tiny. Should I redo the whole thing or do, do it, it on another Paint page? it, yeah. So it'll be a small yeah. miniature size small of, uh, cluster, yeah. Oh. Okay, so during the week now, do you want to try painting the fruit uh, or the vegetables like we have painted, uh, like I've shown you in detail how to paint the other fruit? I've tried to take a sample of the different vegetables with different uh, characteristics, like both the brandon and the bell pepper have got uh, a deep color and a shiny skin, so you have a very sharp highlight but the cabbage doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you should be able to paint most, almost everything, maybe except the lettuce and the artichoke. And I can show you that. But the rest should be easy. So even the artichoke, let me let me show you one segment mm -hmm. and that, that will then clear up all dogs. Aditi, how do you do lettuce? How do I do lettuce? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Do you so, have like a, some other class that you did lettuce or something like a leafy vegetable? I'm, I'm sure I have, but I, I can take that on. I'll show you how to draw the lettuce here also. Give me 10 minutes more. I know it's uh, already 12.30. No, so, no. Yes, yes. I'll We'd quickly, like to see the lettuce and the artichoke. Yeah, I'll quickly demonstrate this. And then you can maybe also watch the recording later tomorrow. Okay, so I'm just going to finish drawing this quickly, arbitrarily. The most important thing over here is usually color matching. 
So the colors would be sap green, uh, lemon yellow a little bit, and yellow ochre to tone the whole thing down. If it is not toned down, sap green and lemon yellow can give you a very fluorescent color, and you don't want that. Now, we also need a slightly deeper color. And often you can get those deep colors by adding cobalt blue to sap green. So these are the two colors that I'm going to work with. I can give the entire artichoke a wash in this light color. So I'll do that. I'll do the salad and come back to this. And when giving a wash, I'm carefully going to leave a few sections unpainted like this, just towards where I have the highlight. So can you see my brush is moving in the areas where there is more shadow and then along the edges of the segments where there is no shadow, but it's not going to be too dark. So already I have built in some dimension over here. And I can also add a little bit of the deeper color at this stage, again in the same spaces. When your drawing is ready, you just need to reinforce the idea with color. So I'm dropping in color literally because if I try to paint the color so wet that I'm just carrying that color from one section to another on my back. That's stage one. Similarly, for lettuce, I can do the exact same thing. It is white here in the center. So I'm going to leave that section unpainted. And in fact, you can also take away a little bit of the color and paint along these sections. Now, every time I paint something like that, I paint with my, my brush uh, almost floating on top. I, I don't paint it flat because then I get the uh, I get very uneven shades, shapes, and that's great for painting vegetables. In the same process again, I'm going to drop a few dark spots in between. And never in a sequence. I won't draw all of them next to each other. Because you want to keep it organic. Once this stage is done, you can take a thinner brush, a darker, deeper, thicker color, and go around the edges. You can go do the same process again, like take from the middle of the segment, I'm going to take a little deep color and then add a little dark color along the edge to it. And that way I'll get a very dramatic segment. And I can go on the other side of the highlight and do the same. In some places, I can just add a second layer of the base color itself. You don't need to have a dark color. In some places, I will add the dark, dark color for contrast and for drama. But you will always get your cues from the reference image. Now, I've got too much dark color over here. This is just a technique to reduce color. I've washed, washed and wiped my brush. And I'm using that damp brush to spread the shade into its place. So my lettuce is not dry, but lettuce also pretty much has the same process. This is generally good 
And in some places you will have a, a fold or an edge. So you just deepen and darken some of those edges and you should get adequate contrast for it to look like lettuce. And the rest of the line work is pretty much like you would do for the, like you've done for the cabbage. So I would say I'm at 50% of the lettuce. Beyond this is all only going to be detailing in slightly deeper and deeper colors. So deep color here, deep color here. shadow in the, in the right place of the right shape and this will start looking like lettuce. Now in isolation this may not look like a lettuce especially now because it's halfway there but when all the fruit are, are sorry I keep calling it fruit all the vegetables are done in that context this will definitely look like lettuce. Uh, does that help you Sushmi? Definitely, Adhiti. Thank you. Very helpful. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. okay. So give it a shot. If you feel you have any problems, uh, I would recommend just write down what your problem is right then and there on the back of the page. Because you might forget what the exact problem was. Um, and you don't have to write the problem in technical terms. So you could just say, I keep adding paint but it just becomes a big pool or my paint dries before I can add the next color. Any language that you can use to communicate the problem and I can diagnose what the issue might be. There are just four or five things that could be going wrong and it just takes practice to know whether your uh, brush is too loaded, whether you have too much water, too little water, the wrong size of brush. And if you are... Um, over painting. That's about it. So it's just one or two of these things and we can tweak your technique and bring you on track. Aditi, have you done this in any other class? The I have. I have. I have done it in the Saturday class from the 2nd or the 3rd of September and I'll share that link with you. Please, it's, if you could. The two classes I've done it in, I'll share both with you. Okay, one of the quick questions is, can you, can you send that image that you uh, just did. Yeah. The, yeah, that'll be helpful. Thank you. Book, right? I'll, I'll send it. I'll put it on the group. Okay. All right. Um, so if you've managed to do anything, please share on the group uh, so we can have a discussion. Next week, I am going to be doing another diff uh, kind of um, collage, but the style of painting is a little more casual. Here, we are trying to make it more realistic. There, we're going to try to make it quicker and more impressive. So next week should be a little easier. If you can get some color pencils, like the Camelin or Camel color pencils, just 12 color, it's not very expensive, that will help. If you have uh, Micron pens, um, this is in the list of materials. I don't know, Rohit and Shweta, if, if I've sent you this. You can just get a number two and number five Micron tip pen. That should be fine. Okay. Okay, so I'll see you next week then. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um,